Good morning. It's a chilly uh, uh, October 4th, Sunday, and uh, we just had two great outdoor services. I usually like to open and say it's 82 degrees with a nice breeze coming off the Pacific, but I can't lie today because it was chilly out there. But what a great day. It's a beautiful day, and it's going to be a great day to worship the Lord. So I'm Father Taylor Albright. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to our online service of worship. And so to do that, as we get ready to worship, let's remember that the one thing, the one thing this is all about is not so much what are we going to get from this today's service as much as it is, what are we going to give to the Lord today, to give him our whole hearts, just even to focusing our, our thoughts and attention and our prayers and thanksgivings. So to do that, let's begin with a prayer just to kind of set the area where you pray and to set your heart on the Lord, all right? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would gift us with the presence of your Holy Spirit here in our church, but especially at home with every person looking at a screen today, whether it's the TV screen in the living room or whether it's the computer screen or on a phone or whether it's not even Sunday, but it's somebody checking in on Facebook and maybe it's Wednesday. But I pray that you would fill that space set it apart, sanctify that space for worship this morning. Drive far from us all distractions. Lift from us the heaviness and gloom. And Lord, allow us to, to know your presence with us this morning. And fill our hearts, Lord, so that we might give you the praise and the honor to which that's, that you are due, that you are worth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Really great stuff coming up, but we're going to get ready to begin our service. So we're going to sing a song. What a perfect song for today. Uh, Awake my soul, stretch every nerve. We're going to go for it. And so please join as we, as we begin with our opening hymn this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now join me in this great hymn, a uh, very ancient hymn uh, that gives glory to God. Let's say this together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, 
in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let us pray together, saying, Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, you know what that means. It's time to go find out if I can actually pull off two in a row where I figure out what this red box mystery is. So take my mask, get in the car, and I'll see you at the red box. It's a tough trip here, but we're still in the parking lot of the church. It's nice to see. Beautiful day here. Kind of like that day a couple weeks ago when Eliana was here. So anyway, great day for the Red Box. I'm here. The Red Box is here, but no Red Box person. Oh, wait, here he comes. Hi, my name is Isaac with a mask at church. His name is Isaac with a mask. <laughs> with a mask. You have to spell that on your school papers, Isaac with the mask. No, it's a whole other joke. <laughs> okay, so Isaac, you have to buy the red box. You can hand it to me. I have to ask this question. Anything alive in here? No. <laughs> okay, nothing alive. That's good. That's good. And it's something very small. At first, I thought it was a small chocolate cookie, which I was going to eat. But it's not. I don't know if you can see this. But it says 2020. So you went to the eye doctor and he checked out your vision and he said, yep, you can see 20. No, that's not it. 2020. Well, I know that this year is 2020. So it's something about this year, right? Am I close? At least it's about this year, right? Don't say yet. So I'm going to say here's the message is that even though it's a year full of chaos, God is still in control in 2020. And because I'm so good at this, I know that this is exactly what you were gonna say, wasn't it? Yep. Ah, man, all right. So nice and loud, walk up a little closer. This way. Um, um, this way, there you go. Uh, I know what I have planned for you. I have a good, I have good plans for you. So God has good plans for us in 2020. So, man, that's what we need to hear that God's got some good plans because this has been the weirdest year of all time, I think. Right? Well, I wasn't close. I didn't get the red box right again next week. All right. So thank you, Isaac. And here's a fake high five. All right. Isaac was with a mask. I'm Father Taylor, and I'm heading back to church. So see you guys later. Ready? Hey, thanks so much, Isaac. That was great. Just want to point out that Isaac is a crossbreed of a kid. He's a Red Sox fan. But in the fall, he pulls for the New York Giants. Go figure. It's one of the mysteries of life. Anyway, we continue our service with the readings. The first reading is from Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. 
And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge me because me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 80. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your righteousness in your countenance that we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it and took the root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its bough. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. The second reading is from Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. 
Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parables, his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Lord Christ. And now, Lord, as we come and as we've read your word, Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts. Help us to hear that word which is meant for us. Help us to open our hearts, to pay attention to you and to hear you speak to us this morning and give us the courage, Lord, to do what you ask us to do. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk to you about two profound thoughts that Paul talks about in this letter to the Philippians. They are profound because these, this is just not the way we think, particularly when it comes to God. Two profound thoughts. The first one is this, is that Paul not only says that you can know God, but he says that you should expect it's a natural thing for a Christian to be able to know God, not just to know about Jesus, but to actually know him and experience. And that that is the most, as he said, it surpasses anything you could ask or imagine. So the first thought is that you and I can know Jesus. Walking in this world right now, we can know him and the experience of knowing him surpasses anything that we could want to hold on to. That's the first thought. The second one is this, is that we, while we think that somehow that, uh, that God should be the one, if God is true and if God is good and if God is all powerful, that God will help us. He shows us his love and blessing by helping us avoid difficult things, to avoid challenges, to avoid suffering. Paul says, no, no. You know God in suffering. And so he embraces suffering, not as something he wants to do, but something in which he actually comes to know God better. So two thoughts, you can know God and God isn't here, doesn't show us his love by helping us escape all of suffering, but that we actually come to know Jesus more in suffering. Two profound thoughts. But before I get into that, I just want to tell you a story. When I did that this morning, everybody heard those first two thoughts and they were like, Ugh. and then I said, I'll tell you a story. And you can see people had a sigh of relief. Yeah, let's hear a story. So this is actually a true story. And uh, the irony of the story is I thought about it. Kitty and I, this happened about the first year we were married. And so we were still living uh, in Boston in seminary. And uh, I couldn't remember where the story took place. And it turns out it took place in Granby. How about that? Who knew? Anyway, here's a true story. We were going to a wedding, uh, friends of Kitty's, uh, and it was one of those like July days where it was just 
perfect but hot weather. You know, the sky was blue, crystal clear. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning. The sun hadn't really gotten super hot. Just a beautiful day. The day, you know, that you really picture for a great wedding. The church was very pretty. It had these big columns in front. And, uh, and as you went in, what you noticed was at the wall on the sides, uh, there were these glass windows. They weren't stained glass. They were clear so that all that light came right into the church. It was, it was, really, it was really beautiful. And uh, the service was going along, and the pastor got up, and he was doing his sermon. And uh, he, he did something, for, you know, some, some pastors write their sermons up, but every once in a while, they'll depart from the sermon, and they kind of improvise a little bit. He must have been on a roll, and so he went ahead, and he, and he cut away from his sermon, and he said this, these, these words, which I still remember. And the words are this. God is showing you his blessing by giving you the weather. Even the weather shows us God's blessing to you today. Even this weather, this beautiful weather, shows you God's great blessing upon you today. Well, it, it was like a matter of minutes that these beautiful, bright, uh, beautiful sky and the beautiful bright light coming in, suddenly there were like gray clouds and then those dark you know, thunderstorm clouds that come up in the summer. And about just two or three minutes after he had said those great words, the place grew dark because a huge thunderstorm came down, peals of thunder, you know, like bam, you know, you, you could hardly hear him speak because the thunder was so loud. And then buckets of rain. It wasn't like a drizzle. I mean, you could hear it on the roof, the whole place, just huge showers. And so of course, everybody sat there like, well, if the weather is the way God is showing us your blessing or not, you know, what could that mean for your wedding? So I myself wrote down note to self, never call attention to the weather, you know, in the middle of a wedding sermon. But here's, here's what I thought was interesting about it is that that's a natural way that we think. I mean, it wasn't a bad call on his part. He just, you know, who knew that a thunderstorm was coming, but we imagine that if God loves us, and God not only loving us and knowing us, but God being all powerful, then God will show us his love and blessing by making sure that we avoid that terrible thing. And that's terrible with a capital T. Throughout your life and our lives, you know, we know that there are these terrible things that we don't want to see ever happen to us or someone we know and love. I just call them the terrible. And if God really loves us, how could he allow the terrible thing to happen? So we see somehow that God in loving and blessing should come through the absence of difficult adversity. But what Paul says, two things that are very profound. One, that we also, you know, we respond to God in this way, that uh, when, when we pray about things like weather, we'll say, someone will say to me, hey, um, why don't you like make a prayer to the man upstairs, you know, or God at a distance? This hymn that you sang this morning, I, I wanted to like say, no, no, that's not true. That we don't hear a voice from on high that beckons us because God isn't far from us. And so uh, when we're thinking about God, we think one, God is distant. And two, that if God loves us, he should show, you know, he, we will avoid the difficult things. Well, here's the deal. Paul says, neither of those things are true. Neither of those things are true. He says and expects that we can know Jesus right here now, that we can know Jesus, not just about Jesus, but we can know him. And the, and the experience of knowing him, he says, surpasses anything that you could ask, that you could accomplish, any status that you could be. So that's the first thing. So let's take a look at the scriptures. He writes, more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I suffered loss of all things, and I regard them as rush, rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. So the first thing he says is this. He says, all the things that I've accomplished in my life. Now think about Paul, business owner. 
He was uh, schooled at the Loomis Chafee in the Harvard of his day under famous rabbis. He was an expert in the law. He spoke several languages fluently. He was a guy who had traveled. He was a Roman citizen. I mean, so, so this is the guy that accomplished and achieved all things. And when it came to his church life, or should I say his religious life, Paul had to say, look, I got the right pedigree. My family is from the tribe of Benjamin. I've been a Pharisee. I've been shown the zeal. You, know, you can see the zeal for God in my life. He had all these things accomplished. You know, we just met with a group of little kids, you know. And so I said, you know, have you ever gotten a trophy? Sure, we've gotten trophies. It's like he has all these trophies of his accomplishments of status and having arrived and even a place which should say, this is where he is in his religion with God. And he says, you know what? All of those are worthless because they become obstacles to the real thing. And the real thing is not something that I've, righteousness I've achieved or status I've achieved, but this righteousness, the one that comes through faith in Christ. And so first he says that uh, he wants to be found in Christ. And that's a reference to his standing in God, that through God and through the righteousness of Jesus, his place in God is as a son, it's that whole package of what it for salvation in his life. So he's, his, his foundation is now in Christ. But he goes on from there to say that he wants to know Christ. He wants to know Christ in both the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings. The power of his resurrection and sharing in his sufferings. In chapter one, Paul says that he is, he is so fascinated and wants to know Christ face to face so badly because it's such a, a rich thing that he's not sure whether it's better to continue in this life uh, doing the work that does a part of the mission, which he thinks is the most important thing you can do in the world, or whether to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Here's a guy fully alive, fully engaged, a great sense of purpose, all these accomplishments. And he's saying, you know what? I'd give it all up just to be with Christ because his experience of knowing Christ was the greatest thing he'd ever had in his life. And then he goes on to say that I want to know Christ in the greatness, the good times, the, 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 the power of his resurrection. Now, what does that mean, the power of his resurrection? It's the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, which is at work at him. It's that power which changes a soul from death to life. It's the power of the resurrection that can take a relationship which seems like there's no hope and it's over and bring it to life. It's the power of the resurrection that can make, take a person physically ill and have them be healed. It's the power of the resurrection that gives us a new sense of hope that you can go out on a day and it seems like the possibilities of God. He wants to know God in that power. But he doesn't stop there. He says, in the sharing of his sufferings. Now, for years I looked at sharing in his sufferings, meaning that somehow because he was working on the mission, that the things he suffered along the way, sharing in, in the sufferings for Christ, I thought that's all of that meant, that's, that, that, that was focused on. But that's not it. Christ Jesus himself, as the Son of God, came to share not only in our humanity to be like us, but to share in our sufferings. Think about that. You know, although his state was divine, this is what we preached about last week, you know, he didn't think that his equality God was something to be grasped, but he let it go and emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. And the extent of which he followed that path was all the way to death. That means that Jesus, think about this, that the Son of God, Jesus, who we're worshiping today, knows exactly what it's like to have your family wonder if you've gone off the deep end, because his family had to wonder about that. He knows what it's like when your closest friends betray you. He knows what it's like to be slandered. He knows what it's like to be arrested. He knows what it's like to go through physical pain and suffering. If you think about the story of that when Jesus was at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he wept. He knows the pain of loss. 
He even knows the pain of, of dying. And in that moment of dying, he knows what it's like to feel like, to wonder, has God abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows our suffering all the way up to death. He first entered into our suffering. And so when Paul says he wants to know Christ in his, the fellowship of his sufferings, it means the fellowship of our suffering together, that Christ has already been there in suffering. And so that when you're going through it, you're not alone from a God who's on high, who says, you know, I wish I could do something. You are with Christ in suffering. You are with Christ. I want to know him in the sharing of his sufferings all the way to being conformed to the image of his death. Paul, who has known him as the, as the one who changed his life, the one who changed his whole perspective, he has seen the power of God working in him. He's seen other people come to faith. He's seen all the power of the resurrection. It says, but there's more. I need to know him also in the fellowship of his sufferings. And so we would love to avoid sufferings. We have thought for many years, probably most of our lives, that if God really loved us and blessed us and was hearing our prayers, he would take us away from sufferings. But here's what he says. He says that Jesus can be known in suffering. And that he points ahead that, that that's not the end of it. It isn't just like, you know, let's suffer to know God. He goes all the way to the point that he will know Jesus in the resurrection. And so our sufferings, though temporary and difficult, our way that we can know Christ and it will all come together and we're all together again when Jesus returns and we all experience the resurrection. God is close. The expectation having given, given us the gift of the Holy Spirit is that you and I can know Jesus intimately now. And it's, it's a relationship which isn't, isn't just about our status. It's a relationship which gives us life which surpasses understanding. The kids at the 845 service said, it's like Christmas every day, where there's always some other way of God opening another gift. And some of those gifts are the power of the resurrection gifts. And some of those gifts are the gifts of knowing him intimately and depending on him through suffering. And it doesn't end there because we know that even beyond when we go to be with the Lord at time of death, we know that we will all be gathered together in the time of, of the resurrection when Jesus returns. And so here's the, here's the thing I'd like to ask you. If in the past you have known Jesus, and you really felt like I have known Jesus in the power of his resurrection, are you still feeling that right now? It's quite possible that the way that having been under the heavy blanket of the COVID virus for seven months, the restrictions that have gone on, all the political upheaval that's around us, the news that we have to deal with, that the heaviness of it all and our inability to get together and gather as usual, maybe has, has, a, has had an effect on your spiritual life but you can return, you can know Jesus. And he wants you to know him right now in the midst of all of this. It might be a little harder, but he, he is there and he is there calling to you, beckoning to you by the spirit to come and know him. If you have never known that kind of an intimate relationship, I'd say, Paul says, this is the expectation, the gift of learning, of, of believing in Jesus is to know him in this way. And so maybe your prayer this morning might be, Lord, I didn't even know that was possible. And it's hard for me to believe, but help me to find what that means to know you, both in the power of your resurrection and in suffering. And the secondly is about that suffering. Maybe you or someone right now is dealing with that terrible thing. That terrible thing is something none of us would choose, but God has not forsaken you in that that Paul says that it's possible to know him even in the midst of suffering and that knowing him surpasses even the pain of it all. And so today, what we want to press on to is knowing Jesus, taking full advantage of the gift and the presence of the Spirit in our lives to know him, which surpasses all understanding. 
for which Paul said, I count all my achievements and my status as a loss for the, for the gain of Jesus Christ. So let's press on, let's press on to knowing him more and more in our lives. So I say these words morning, this morning to encourage you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we do our go to the creed, I just want to remind you uh, to in your chat or uh, um, or in your um, on, on your Facebook link to go ahead right now and think first of all what things are you most thankful for? Maybe there's just one thing that you can think of today, just one thing, and I want you to put that in there so we can share that together. Secondly, to think of three questions. Where do we need to see God intervening in the wider world? Where do we need to see God intervening in our country? And third, who is a person who you know needs God's loving care and fellowship and healing, whatever? Who is a person who needs God's uh, help today to begin sending those in so that we can lift those up together? All right? Well, we'll continue now with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so now I'd like to give you a moment just to consider what's on your heart today and to send in your thanksgivings and your prayers. So now in peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our presiding Bishop Michael, our bishops Ian and Laura, and all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church. And now I invite your prayers and thanksgivings.
Heavenly Father, we pray for our world, this world that you have made, this world that is yours, this world that you love so much that you gave your only son. We pray for all the nations of the world, and we pray for your peace and the coming of your kingdom. We also pray, Lord, about this virus, which has caused additional turmoil and suffering, not only in our own country, but throughout the world. In your great mercy, Lord, we pray that you would bring an end to this virus. And we pray that, Lord, that, that all that, is, that we're meant to learn and know and accomplish by this, I pray that your will would be done. But I pray for those nations where, that need health care. We pray for our friends in Nigeria and for those at the Kateri clinics and for uh, Bishop Marcus Dogo, for Bishop John and the schools. We pray for their protection and your blessing. We pray, Lord, for uh, our own country. We pray, as you have asked us, to pray for our president, our vice, the vice presidents, members of Congress, members of the court system, all those who hold authority. We pray, Lord, that you would guide the hearts of our leaders. Lord, we guide all these nations for a place of justice and peace. We pray for our president's health. We pray, Lord, that he would be healed and all the members of the Senate and all those folks who have recently become ill with the COVID virus would be carefully taken care of. We pray for our election process and we pray for the end of these deep divisions that we have in our country. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with different kinds of mental illnesses for whom this time of year or this COVID season is most difficult. And we pray for all of our friends who are dealing with uh, substance abuse issues uh, and addictions. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, healing for people we know who need your help. We pray particularly, Lord, this morning for Bob, for Kyle, for Serena, for Nancy, and for Dennis. We pray also, Lord, for Tara and Wayne. We pray for Larry. We pray for Ronnie, Rebecca, and AJ. We pray for Beth and Chad for Billy, and we give thanks, Lord, for your healing work in Cameron. We pray for Tim and for Mike and Anne, Heidi, Robert, and William. Other prayers that you have this morning, who else would you want to pray for? Just go ahead and let's share those now while we're all gathered here together to pray. Just bring those to the Lord. We continue to pray for Mark's healing. And we pray, Lord, that he would be completely healed, Lord, of the cancer that he's dealing with. We pray for Cynthia and Donna. We pray also for the members of our own church family who because of the virus and because of having to deal with so much work on the internet, for whom even doing a Zoom service has become very difficult we pray, Lord, for the day that you would gather us together again. But we pray that even now we might gather together in one spirit. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Lord, praying today, thanking you for all these different groups we have, learning and going deeper with you in our Psalms group. We thank you, Lord, that you are, don't, don't abandon us, but you are with us, perhaps even closer during times of suffering. We're thankful for our family who knows Jesus and that laughter that comes as a healing balm in difficult times. We thank you for the music ministry. We thank you for the life of Polly Parker, 
uh, Polly Parker's mom. And we ask your continued care and consolation to Polly and her brothers and grandkids is at, the, at the loss of her mom. And we do, Lord, even though it changes, we do thank you for this beautiful weather we're having today. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. And if there's someone you'd like to remember, just please to bring their name now. We, go ahead, you can do it right now. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins, saying together, most merciful God, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may Almighty God of mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. So I just have one uh, announcement to talk about before we continue. And that has to do with uh, the burial service uh, for Father Frank Howard. If you didn't know him, I, I call him the, the one who laid the foundation of the church that we know today. He was the rector here uh, from 1975 to 1998. Uh, and he was a guy that really for, met for so many people seemed to be such a close reflection of Jesus. Uh, so not only to establish here, but he created all this kind of faith connections for people and uh, established the healing ministry that was from Father Frank. So uh, this Thursday will be his service. It's at 10 o'clock now. Because of the virus, it is not uh, open. And so it's essentially a private service because of the numbers. We can only have so many people in the building. However, I'm asking you to consider two things. One, uh, that if you're interested in serving as an usher, mostly outside, just helping people distance and helping people to come in the building and to get out of the building, if you'd be interested in helping with that, to go ahead and call the office and we will connect you to Bill Broda, that's his ministry. We'll connect you to him so that you can uh, sort that out and, and you can help with the service. That would be a great thing for, for us to have. Secondly, I'm just encouraging you, if you were around during the day, that sometime between 10 and maybe you know, closer to 11, that you might come and just be present outdoors, outside of the church. And so that as Joyce uh, leaves, gets ready to go, she could see some other people just you know, saying thank you. Thank you to her. It's just really hard. Think about how hard that is that uh, you know, Father Frank, who was such an instrumental person here in all these relationships, and yet we can't uh, fully celebrate by coming together. So, uh, but I do encourage you to come, to go ahead and come anyway on Thursday, stay outside, keep on your mask. And as people come, you can, you can wave and just thank her uh, for, for all that uh, Frank meant in your life. All right. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, uh, an offering and sacrifice unto God. Oh. 
right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And now because we are unable to receive Let's pray together the prayer of St. Alphonsus, saying, My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. 
I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And now let's pray together this beautiful post-communion prayer of thanksgiving, saying together, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in this time, this odd time of this virus, sometimes the greatest ministry you might be able to do this week is simply to pick up the phone and to call someone that you haven't spoken to in a while. And as you do that, you too will be a light for our world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And now, if you would go ahead and sing along at home to this next, our final hymn, O oh, Love How Deep. So thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. And uh, remember, you can always pick up the phone. You can call me direct, send me a text, send me an email. Just not on Monday, uh, but I'm glad to hear from you. Glad to pray with you, talk, just to, just to get together for a coffee distance would be great to do. So I hope that you have a great week this week and press on to knowing Jesus. So let us go forth now in the love of God. Thanks be to God.